Hallelujah. 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 Give a praise and honor to Jehovah God and thank him for our lives and the opportunity to call upon his name, his name on this day. You may be seated. Thank Jehovah God for all that he does for us, for waking us up this day, allowing us to, this opportunity to call upon, call upon his name, to worship before him and to acknowledge his greatness and that he reigns supreme over all. We acknowledge that he has no beginning and he has no end. He is the first and he is the last. And there is none that can be compared to him. So we are grateful unto him for this opportunity to worship before him and to acknowledge that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. The one that we read about it in the book of Genesis in the beginning that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we acknowledge him for all that he does for us for providing us with food, with shelter, and with clothing. We thank him for providing us with the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that we have this day to know that he alone is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we are grateful unto him for teaching us that we are the children of Israel. He has given us an opportunity that many people of Israel do not have. So we have to take advantage of this opportunity that he has given unto us and serve him with all of our heart, soul, and might. As we read in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, for Jehovah is one and his name was one. And we have to make sure that we unify ourselves with him under his word that he has given us. So we are grateful to the king of the universe for allowing us the opportunity to open up his word and praying that he would give us the strength to persevere in this way of life that he has given unto us. We pray for strength. We pray that he gives us strength. We also pray that he would give us, that he would continue to give us the truth of his word so that we would not intentionally stumble before him. And also praying that when we do stumble that he will pick us up and help us along the way. For we know that we'll be, there will be times that we will stumble. But we just pray that the Most High, Jehovah, will continue to walk before us and also protect us from behind. That everything that he has, we have to acknowledge that everything that we have is given to us from him. So when we ask for protection, we only ask for protection for the things that he has already given us. That as he has given it unto us, we also have to appreciate everything that he gives us as well. So we also have to appreciate the word that he has given unto us. Just as any gift that somebody would give to you, our lives are a gift from the creator of the heavens and the earth. So we have to cherish our lives. And how we cherish our lives by taking care of ourselves and making sure that we follow the instructions that he gives unto us so that we will learn how to take care of ourselves. And also the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding that he gives unto us is also a gift. So we have to cherish that as well by living according to that word. So we are thankful to the Most High this day for allowing us to this opportunity to call upon his name. And we're going to go into the book of Second Chronicles, starting in chapter 17, as we continue to read within the history of the children of Israel, more specifically the kingdom of Judah, which is also known as the southern kingdom of Israel. And we are reading about the kings that existed during that time and the goodness that a majority of them displayed in the sight of the Most High and the amount of reforms that were done. As you see, in, you know, we spoke about it even from the beginning of Chronicles, and you see the recurring theme, although it's focusing on the southern kingdom or focusing on the kingdom of Judah, is also a current or a recurring theme of reform. Because when we get to the end of the book of Second Chronicles, those concluding verses are the exact opening verses of the book of Ezra. So it was written in a style that would encourage people to reform their lives in the sight of the Most High. So we read even, we're going to read about the King Jehoshaphat, and we're going to read about things that were not given to us in the book of, or the, actual, the, the end of the book of First Kings that talks about the life of Jehoshaphat. But we're going to read about the reforms that he made. So we're reading about a lot of kings from the time of Solomon onward, where a majority of them were, when they were enlightened, or when they came into power, they made a lot of reforms because the people went into regression. So this is su supposed to encourage us to make reforms. It also encourages those that are in leadership to make sure that the reforms are done, because the reforms start from the top and work their way down. So when King Jehoshaphat gets into power, as we're going to read in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, he's taking over from his father, Asa, who also made a lot of reforms in his life, even though he made mistakes as well. And we're going to read about the reforms that Jehoshaphat made and also 
some of the mistakes that he made as well. Second Chronicles chapter 17. <clears throat> We're in the second book of Chronicles. Chapter 17, verse 1, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jehoshaphat his son reigned in his stead and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fortified cities of Yehuda, and he set garrisons in the land of Yehuda, and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. So during this time when it says that, you know that Jehoshaphat, his son, we talk about he's the son of Asa, the king that we just read about previously, he strengthened himself against Israel. We know that Judah is a part of Israel as a nation. But this book, and also thinking about what people would think about at this time, that they were two separate nations. So you had Judah and you had Israel. That's why in the book of Ezekiel, when the Most High is speaking to Israel, he's saying he's going to join the stick of Ephraim with the stick of Judah, because in their minds, they are two separate kingdoms. But Yehoah is saying that the 12 tribes are one nation before him. So Jehoshaphat comes into power and he's strengthening himself against Israel because there were at times wars between Judah and Israel. Israel representing, or at that time, being known as the northern tribe only. Even though from our perspective of being Israelites, we know that all 12 tribes are Israel. But from the perspective of people living during this time, was Rehoboam was placed as king of Judah, and Jeroboam was placed as king of the northern kingdoms, of the northern tribes. The northern tribes were known as Israel, and the southern tribe, which is Judah, became known as the kingdom of Judah. So when he strengthened himself against Israel, it's because there was tension previously between Judah and Israel. So he set up garrisons even in Ephraim. So when you look at the map of how the tribes were separated in the land of Israel, you had Judah to the south, then you had Benjamin right above that, and then you had Ephraim above Benjamin. Right. So they set up, he set up garrisons in Ephraim, even though Ephraim is where Samaria is, and Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. But he set up garrisons in that territory to make sure that if there's going to be anybody from Israel coming down, the garrisons would stop that or at least be able to give word to everybody else so that they would know that war's being set on. Just to give a little background on why he was strengthening himself against Israel. Continue. Verse 3. And the Lord, whose name is Jehovah, was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto the Baalim, but sought unto the God of his father and walked in his commandments, and not after, their do after the doings of Israel. Therefore, Jehovah established the kingdom in his hand, and all Yehuda brought to Jehoshaphat presents. And he, he and, ha and he had riches and honor in abundance, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of Jehovah. And furthermore, he took away the high places and the Asherim out of Yehuda. So we've seen that there were kings prior that were doing a lot of cleanup, but even in the time of Jehoshaphat, he still had to do cleanup as well. That just, just gives us a picture of how much dirt there was. If king after king is still removing dirt, that means there's still a lot of dirt going on. And every yeah. king at this point, most of the kings at this point are doing the best that they can to clean up the land. His father did an excellent job. His father, even though he's not known as one of the best kings out there, because you all know about David, who was just mentioned here, we know about Solomon. You know, his father outside did a lot, but he's not known as you know, one of the great kings. And Jehoshaphat's name, you know, people know that name, jumping Jehoshaphat, you know, things like that, slogans that might be out there in the world, but you don't get to really know much about Jehoshaphat. But when it says that he walked in the ways of his father, Dawid, because Dawid, the first king of the entire, well, you know, Saul was the first king, the second king, so to, to explain it better, Amen. that King, da king David epitomized one that walks with the Most High. So even though there were kings prior to Jehoshaphat that did right in the side of Jehovah, when there were certain kings that did good, they referenced their goodness all the way back up to David. That's the type of name that King David had and still has even up until today as being that king that brought the nation together. The one that, that the Most High, you know, protected, the one that walked, in the, you know, walked with the Most High, prayed to the Most High constantly. So we have to learn to emulate. When we read throughout the Holy Scriptures, learn to emulate the ways of the good people that we read about. So Jehoshaphat's goodness was, you know, related to David, and it mentioned that how he sought the God of his father, he walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. Because once again, it's written in a style that is talking about Judah versus Israel. 
When you read the history of Israel from the books of First and Second Kings, you see that a majority of their kings were doing evil. We're going to see that during the time of Jehoshaphat. This is also during the time of Ahab. And Ahab is, is infamous Amen. with evil. So when Jehoshaphat now walking in the ways of, of Israel, he's walking contrary to those evil ways and making sure that he's walking in the right path. Continue. Verse 7. And in the third year of his reign, he sent princes, even Ben-Hail, and Ovadiah, and Zechariah, and Netanel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Yehuda, And with them the Levites, even Shemaiah, and Netaniah, and Zebadiah, and Asael, and Shemir Amot, and Yehonatan, and Adoniah, and Tobiah, and Tov Adoniah, the Levites, with them Elishama, and Yehoram, the priests. And they taught in Yehuda, having the book of the law of Yehoah with them. And they went about throughout all the cities of Yehuda and taught among the people. So this is something that we, could, we should highlight, something that's not usually brought out, especially in the other books. Because a lot of the kings, we read about how they went through their territories. We just read how he went through the, and took down all of the high places in the Ashram or out of all Judah. But when you do that, you're taking away the belief system that the people had at that time. Right. So what do you do what do you do instead? You have to replace that. Amen. So what he did was, as it mentioned here, and we don't know that we never heard about these people before. Ben Hale or Ben um, Hayel is probably pronounced in Hebrew and Obadja and Zakaria and Natan. We never heard about these people before. We know about the kings. So we know about Jehoshaphat at the time. He's the king. He's the leader of Israel, of the kingdom of Judah. But there were other people that he sent out to teach the word of God. So these people were instrumental in going forth and make sure that, number one, the high places don't get put up again, but also the people are taught the right way. This is the responsibility that those of us that have the word of the most, and that's everybody, not just those that teach and those that lead. This is the responsibility that we have collectively as a congregation, as a community. We bring the word of the most high to the people. We can't just wait for people to come to us to learn. Amen. Jehoshaphat sent the people out into all the cities of Judah with the book of the law of Jehovah to teach them. And, these pe and the names that were mentioned, once again, these names were mentioned here, and you, we won't read about them anywhere else. But they were instrumental in teaching the law of Jehovah. So it's not always about trying to get fame for yourself. It's about doing the work. So Jehoshaphat is the one that gets the credit for this. He's the one that's known throughout history. But there were people that he sent out. Some were Judites and some were Levites that he, he sent out. And they would open up what we would know today as schools of learning in the various cities. So it wasn't just a one day a week thing where people, or one day, or two, three times in a year where, where people had to go to Jerusalem Amen. to learn in the Most High. The only commandment that we're given is in the book of Deuteronomy, should be 31, where once every seventh year in the time of Sukkot, where everybody goes and they hear the entire law being read. But what is being done in the other six years of that cycle of seven? It's a constant learning that has to be done. So once again, it's not about waiting for people to come to a place of worship to learn. The places of worship have to go to where the people are. So we also have to consider that, you know, when there's people that go out in the street corners and stuff like that, the method is correct. correct. The words that are spoken are, are wrong, but the method is of bringing the word to the people where the people are is correct because we can't stand aloof and just think that because we have it the most I was going to send people to us so that they can have it as well Amen. the responsibility of Yehoshaphat said is I'm tearing out all these Asherim I'm tearing out the everything that these people believed in he tore it all down but what are they going to do afterward they have to learn the law and he can't just say well just come here and learn that he had to send people out there to teach so there have, to be very, there have to be various teachers that are able to go out and teach the word as well. Continue. Verse 10. And a terror from Jehovah fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were around about Yehuda, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. And some of the Philistines bought Jehoshaphat presents and silver for tribute. And the Arabians also bought him flocks, 7,700 7, rams and 7,700 he goats. And Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly. And he built in Yehuda castles and cities of store. And he had many works in the cities of Yehuda. And the men of war, mighty men of valor in Yerushalayim. So we read in the Proverbs, when you please Yehovah, he makes even your enemies at peace with you. The Philistines were enemies to Israel. The Arabians were enemies to Israel. 
But because Jehoshaphat did good, a terror was put upon those nations from Jehovah. So even though they were still considered enemies to Israel, or to Judah most specifically, they were paying tribute because they were afraid of what could happen to them. And Jehoshaphat, up until this point, we never read or have not read where he had any wars yet or where he was going out to battle and beating people down to where they would be afraid of a battle or something like that. But when you do good, Jehovah God causes things to go well with you. So now, Jehoshaphat, has t- he's, he went out, he did the right thing. He went out, tore all the idolatry down, sent out, words to, sent out people to teach the word of the Most High. Now he has time to build castles, to build up cities of store. So when you have a time of peace, you also have time for preparation. So that's why he was also able to have men of war, mighty men of valor. We don't read about any wars yet, but he still has time to make preparation for what may or may not happen. But you also have time to deal with infrastructure as well. So he's not worried about enemies coming in. Now he can worry about taking care of the people on a spiritual and physical level, or what we could know today as a social and economic level. Continue. Verse 14. And this was the numbering of them according to their father's houses, of Yehuda, the captains of thousands, Adna, the captain with him, and a mighty man of valor, 300,000. The neck, and next to him was Yehohanan, the captain, and with him 204 score thousand. And next to him, Amasia, the son of Zikri, who was among, who was willingly offered, who willingly offered himself unto Yehoah, and with him 200,000 mighty men of valor, and of Benjamin, Eliada, a man of valor, a mighty man of valor, and with him 200,000 armed with bow and shield, and next to him was Jehoshaphat, and with him 104 score thousand ready, prepared for war, these are they that waited on the king, besides those whom the king put in the fortified cities throughout all Yehuda. So you add that all up, and you might get close to a million people, if not more. Of, and that's just people that were trained in the army at this time. So Jehoshaphat, once again, doing the right thing in the sight of the Most High, he was also able to send people out to teach, also send people out to train and guard the cities of Yehuda of as well. So Jehoshaphat was doing well for himself because he was doing well in the sight of the Most High. So we can do well for ourselves if we do well in the sight of the Most High. And that's what we learned from that. But also Jehoshaphat made a mistake. And we're going to read about a mistake of his in the next chapter. There's also another mistake he makes later on in his life, the same way he's about to make the same mistake that we read here. And this is, these are also the things that we have to learn from as well. So as well as we do in the sight of the Mosai, we also have to be careful of the mistakes that we can make because they can cost us our lives, or in the case of Jehoshaphat, cause us some level of dignity. But the Mosai will still protect those that continue to walk in that righteous path. Continue. Chapter 18, verse 1, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. And we know, if you know the book of First, the end of First Kings and into Second Kings, you know the pedigree of Ahab. You know about his wife. You know about the things that he did. We know who he killed, took vineyards from. We know about the evils that he did with the Baalim. We know about what he did when dealing with... This is, this is, Jehoshaphat is living during the time of, El, of the prophets Eliyahu, Elijah, mm-hmm. and Elisha. Mm-hmm. That transition from Elijah going into Elisha. This is, but remember, Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah, the son of kingdom. So we don't read about Eliyahu, Elisha dealing with the son of kingdom. We read about Elijah and Elisha dealing with the northern kingdom. Right. But this is during that same time. Amen. So while the northern kingdom is doing a lot of evil, they're led by Ahab, who's done very evil. One mistake that Jehoshaphat made was dealing with Ahab. And that's the message that we also have to learn. So it says that he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. His son, it was, and when you read it in in 2 Chronicles, also connected it with Kings, his son Jehoram married Atalia. And we know, or we will know, what that marriage or what Atalia did later on. And how that was detrimental, at least for a period of time, for the kingdom of Judah. So when they say that he allied, him, he, uh, allied himself in, with Ahab by marriage, it's not him directly. It was his son that married um, Atalia. Continue. Verse 2. Who, oh, sorry. Oh. Who is, depending on how you read in the first Kings, he's e- she's either the daughter of Ahab or 
the, the daughter of Ahab or the daughter of Amri, which would make her the granddaughter of Amri, who is Amri's, um, Ahab's father. But anyway, Atali right. is from that line of Amri, Ahab, and that's who Jehoshaphat allowed his son to, to marry. And you heard a great lesson this morning about marriage and attached with that, learning who you should marry into, what families you should marry into, and things to look out for. Um, Jehoshaphat had a lot to see. He didn't have to worry about courting or anything like that. He knew what evil was going on, so he should not have ha allowed his son to marry into that family. Continue. Two. And after a lapse of years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance, and for the people that were with him, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramot Gilad. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Yehuda, Will thou go with me unto Ramot Gilad? And he answered, he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in war. And that's a statement that he should not have made. The beginning of his tenure of king most likely was during the reign of Omri, once again, who was Ahab's father. And during that time, there was war between Judah and Israel during the time of Omri. Now when Ahab, who was the son of Omri, comes into power, now Jehoshaphat, who had been doing very well for himself, decides to join up with Ahab, even though Ahab, once again, is infamous with evil doing. Amen. And he says to him, when Ahab asks him, when you go, because when you read a lot of the history that Ramot Gilad belongs to Israel, there was a king, Ben-Hadad, who, when you read about in 1 Kings, that at, at some period of time, the northern kingdom of Israel had a war with Ben-Hadad, and they won. And Ben-Hadad was supposed to turn over all of the cities that Aram, Syria, had taken over from Israel and give it back to Israel. So apparently, cities such as Ramot Gilad was not given back to Israel from ben -Hadad. So now Ahab wants to go and get that city. Amen. But he's asking Jehoshaphat to go with him. And Jehoshaphat basically says that even though, and this is it's true in terms of blood, I am as thou art, and my people as thy, as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Yes, we're all Israel. But there are certain things that we should not ally ourselves with. Amen. And there are certain things that we should not unify with. Amen. And that's going to be a cautious thing. If we get into chapter 19, that the Most High is going to definitely teach Jehoshaphat about. And in teaching Jehoshaphat, we can learn about that as well. Amen. It's not just one thing to say we're Israel and we're just going to be together and that's it. Talk about it. There were things such as this. You're doing very well. There's no need to ally yourself with people that are not doing good in the sight of the Most High just because they're Israel, just because you share the same blood from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not going to be enough. The righteousness is what you should lie, ally yourself with. Continue. Verse 4. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of Jehovah today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together. Four hundred men and said unto them, Shall we go up unto Ra to Ramot Gilad to battle, or shall I forbear? And, and, before, they, we, and before we continue... We also been reading about in the, in the Chronicles, what's, when you take on any venture, what's the first thing that you should do? Ask Yehoah. Amen. Jehoshaphat didn't do that. He eventually asked, but he responded to Ahab first and says, Talk we're all the same. But after that, he's, you know, he might have slipped in the mouth and said that, but then now he said, well, ask of Yehoah if we should actually go to the war. That should have been the first thing that he should have said first. Amen. But even before that, he should not have allied himself with Ahab anyway. He should not even be in Samaria at this point where Ahab is slaughtering animals and making this whole big peace treaty thing happen and going on. Especially with Eliyahu condemning Ahab every time that Ahab breathes. Amen. <laughs> and that word probably got back to Jehoshaphat at some point. So you should, we should always learn who we ally ourselves with. But the first thing is to always ask Jehovah God first before you do anything. This was the second thing he did, as opposed to doing it first. Continue. And they said, go up, for God will deliver it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not here besides the prophet of Jehovah that we might inquire of him? So, and sorry for breaking up the verses like this, but the first thing he said is, Jehoshaphat acts. Let's ask of Jehovah today. Can you imagine 400 people? Right. You've seen 400 people before. But just imagine in your mind right now what 400 people look like. Talk about it. So you have 400 people in front of these two kings saying go to war. Amen. 
and your host is looking at a group of 400 people. Talk about it. And says, is there not anybody here that is speaking the word of Jehovah? Out of 400 people. Amen. And so Jehoshaphat, he probably realized he was in the wrong place at the wrong time at this point. Hmm. Because he ended up being here mixed up with Ahab. Already ate, you know, the food that they sacrificed, did all this stuff. And then he starts to realize, well, maybe I should have asked Jehovah first before I got myself involved with this. Amen. And then he asked him, he asked Ahab to, you know, ask, you know, let the prophets come forth. And you got 400 people, 400 prophets saying, go to war. And your host is looking and said, but none of them are prophets of Jehovah. So imagine the, the, the conundrum, so to speak, right. that your host of is in right now, mm -hmm. that he probably wants to get himself out of it, but he already got himself mixed in by his word. You are like me. Your people are like my people. We'll go forth to the war. Talk about it. Continue. Seven. And then the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of Jehovah, but I hate him. For he never prophesied of good concerning me, but always evil. The same as Micaiah, the son of Imla. And I'm su surprised he didn't even mention Eliyahu, who was, doing, who was living during this time. And once again, Eliyahu had nothing ever to say good about Ahab. But that just shows you how much evil was going on in the northern kingdom, that you had Eliyahu, Elisha, and then this other prophet, Micaiah, who was never speaking good about Ahab. And he says, Ahab, remember, think about this. And people usually don't speak directly like this. But we also have to think about the company that we keep and the words that they say and how their actions are. That will show you whether they hate Jehovah or not. For Ahab to say that I hate this man, this prophet of Jehovah, because he never speaks good about me. So do you hate the man? Do you hate Jehovah? Or do you actually hate yourself? Because if he's never speaking good about you, then you have to think about what you're doing. Amen. If you have to get 400 yes men to tell you what to do, but then you have one person that's walking in the, in the walking with the name of Jehovah with him, then you have to consider how you're living before the Most High. And Jehoshaphat, is, once again, he's thinking about this conundrum that he's in, that now this person that he's allied in marriage with says that he hates the prophet of Jehovah. That's a strong word. Amen. But Ahab actually said it because that's what's written. But people don't actually say that today, but they actually show you that Amen. they hate Jehovah God Amen. by not keeping his commandments. So even though they're Yisrael, they know they're Yisrael by seed and blood, so to speak, as the phrase goes. But their actions show you that they hate Jehovah God, even though they won't say it. Their actions will show you. The amount of shop talk they may or may not keep. Amen. The amount of clean food they may or may not eat. Talk about the amount of times that, uh, they may or may not wear fringes. The amount of times they may or may not eat unleavened bread when they're supposed to, and probably eating unleavened bread, eating leavened bread when they're not supposed to. The amount of times that they do a lot of evil, but yet, but yet still fly the banner of Israel, and Israel is supposed to accept them because they're Israel. But well, that's not how it's supposed to be. And we're not supposed to be caught up in that conundrum of worrying about whether we're doing good or right in the sight of Most High. Continue. Hey, Hoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Fetch me quickly, Micaiah, the son of Imla. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Yehuda, sat each on his throne, arrayed in their robes. And they sat in the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. So while they went to send for this one prophet of Jehovah, these 400 prophets are still saying, Go, 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 go. So just imagine the scenery that's happening right now. And Ahab is just ready to go. But Jehoshaphat is like, Now nah, I want to hear from Jehovah God directly first before I actually go. Continue. Verse 10, And Zedekiah the son of Hananiah made him horns of iron, and said, Thus says Jehovah, With these shall thou gore the Arameans until they be consumed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for Jehovah will deliver, into the, to deliver it into the hand of the king. So now they're speaking the name of Jehovah in their mouths, Amen. but Jehoshaphat is still not believing them. We read in the books of in the book of, and the chapters of Deuteronomy chapter 13 and 18, on how you should deal with a prophet, Amen. and how you should deal with a false prophet. And Jehovah God said that he will send false prophets that may speak in his name. 
But if they speak anything contrary to what Jehovah God actually teaches, then that is not a prophet. So we also have to be careful that Jehovah will send people to test us. Amen. That's what the Yahushua is going to learn here. He will be tested. No matter how good he has been, he still will be tested. No matter how good we think we are, we will be tested. And it will come in the name of Yehovah by teachers and leaders that will speak Talk the word it. of God. Talk about it. But leaders contrary to what Yehovah God wants us to go in. Continue. Talk about it. Verse 12. And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, the words of the, the prophets declare good to the king. With one mouth, let thy word, therefore I pray thee, be like unto theirs, and speak thou good. And Micaiah said, as Jehovah liveth, what my God saith, that will I speak. And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go up to Ramoth Gilad to battle, or shall I forbear? And he said, go ye up and prosper and they shall be delivered into thy hand. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou speak, that thou speak unto me nothing but the truth in the name of Jehovah? So what happened first is Micaiah approaches, but before he approaches, you have some of the 400 prophets telling him what to say. Amen. And Micaiah said, No, I'm not going to do what y'all tell me to say. Whatever Jehovah God tells me to say, that's what I'm going to say. Amen. Now when he appeared, remember before that, you had a prophet come, the fourth prophet come, they come up with props with horns and all types of stuff to, to encourage them to go to war. And then when Micaiah actually speaks, Ahab doesn't believe him because he can see the sarcasm in his, in his uh, or hear the sarcasm in his voice. Continue. Amen. 16, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And Jehovah said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And he said, therefore, hear the word of Yehoah. I saw Yehoah sitting upon his throne and all his hosts of heaven standing on his right hand and, I was, and on his left. And Yehoah said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilad? And one spoke, saying, after this manner. And another spoke, saying, after that manner. And there came forth the spirit and stood before Yehoah and said, I will entice him. And Yehoah said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth. And I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt entice him and shall prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now, therefore, behold. Yehoah have put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets. Then Yehoah has spoken evil concerning thee. So Yehoah God can send out a lying spirit. We know that he is the creator of good and evil. So where does Satan come into play? Amen. Yehoah God does everything. So we also, he's going to test us. He also, once again, we read in the book of Deuteronomy, he will send a false prophet to test us. Amen. But when the word of the prophet doesn't come to pass, that's how we know that it's a false prophet even though they speak in the name of Yehovah. So relating it today, just because you have people that lead and people that teach in the name of Yehovah doesn't mean that they're sent by Yehovah God. Amen. That could be our test to see if we're going to follow Yehovah God or not, because we're supposed to be following the king of the universe Talk and not about. mankind. And that's what we get caught up in. So you had these 400, people, 400 men, these 400 false prophets speaking one thing, and the vision that Micaiah received from Yehovah God is that these prophets were sent to lie to Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And it's up to Jehoshaphat to realize, is he going to follow in this lie or not? And obviously, he continues on anyway. Continue. 23. Then Zedekiah, the son of Kananiah, came near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way did the spirit of Jehovah come from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go in the inner chamber to hide thyself because and he didn't respond. But this false prophet, the one that had the horns of saying, you know, you're going to thrust through, after Micaiah spoke, he basically smacked him. So imagine, what he, imagine somebody smacking you. I won't do any you know, props or anything like that, but just imagine somebody walking up to you and smacking you and saying, you know, which way did the spirit of God come from me to hit you? But Micaiah didn't react. Most of us would have reacted. I think most of us would have reacted if somebody smacked us in the face. Oh, that's a fact. <laughs> that's a fact. But Micaiah, he knows what's going to happen in the long run. So sometimes, so in this instant, he said, I'm going to humble myself because I can react right now. Chris Rock. But your end, <laughs> your end is not going to be good. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good um example when um Chris Rock well got smacked by Will Smith, but that was a whole different scenario why that happened. Anyway, continue. Twenty five, and the king of Israel said, "Take ye Micaiah, and carry him back unto Amnon the governor." to Amnon, the governor of the city, and to Yoash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in a prison and feed him with scant bread and with scant water until I return in peace. And Micaiah said, if thou return at all in peace, Yehoah have not spoken by me. And he said, hear ye peoples, all of you. So they're going to put Micaiah in prison un until the war ends and Ahab comes back in peace. That's the plan, so to speak. Continue. Verse 28. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Yehuda, went up to Ramoth Gilad. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go in unto the battle, but thou put on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went in unto the battle. Now the king of Aram had commanded the captains of his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, is this the king of Israel? Therefore they turned about to fight against him. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and Jehoah helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. So and let's analyze this before, as we start to wind down. So Jehoshaphat decided to go into war anyway. He asked to hear from the word of Jehoah. Right. Micaiah came with the word of Jehoah and told, him, told them what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Jehoshaphat still caught up in everything, still goes, decides to go out anyway. And also along with that, there's still some nativity with Jehoshaphat where he, where he can allow Ahab to tell him, yeah. you dress up as a king, I'm going to dress in regular clothes, and let's go to the battle. Jehoshaphat's not thinking about who they're going to attack more, the one that's regular or the one that's in, clothes, in the king's clothing. Amen. And that was the word of the king, of the, Ara the Arameans to say, go attack the king of Israel. Forget about everybody else. But when Jehoshaphat cried unto Jehovah God, probably, you know, the people said, well, Ahab would never cry to Jehovah God, so this can't be Ahab. So they left him, but no matter what, Jehovah saved him because he cried out unto him. But you never want to put yourself in a situation like Amen. this to where you have to cry out to Jehovah when you could have just listened to wisdom from the beginning. Amen. Continue. 32. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew his bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the lower armor and the breastplate. Wherefore, he said to the driver of the chariot, turn thy hand and carry me out of the host, for I am sore wounded. And the battle increased that day. Howbeit, the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Arameans until evening. And about the time of the going down of the sun, he died. So we see that Ahab died at that time, but Jehoshaphat was spared. We're going to try. Yeah, we'll try. Yeah. We'll try. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah. there's a point of this that is mentioned in verse 19 that we should listen to. And it's actually the beginning, but there's going to be some other stuff in chapter 19 as well. But let's hear the response of it. But remember, in all of this, the first thing to do in any situation that you're in, pray to your whole God. Amen. If you're going to do some homework in school, pray to your whole God. Right. If you're going for a job, pray to your whole God. If you're applying to any type of school, pray to Jehovah God. Make sure you put Jehovah God first in everything that you do. It said in Psalms and in Proverbs, commit your ways into Jehovah and he will bring it to pass. So in everything that we do, we have to make sure that Jehovah is first, not second. And Jehoshaphat did so good in his life that he should not have fallen into this trap. But Jehovah saved him. But it's because of a lot of righteousness that he had. But we don't know how much righteousness we may or may not have within us that we can be saved from problems. Continue. Chapter 19, verse 1, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Yehuda, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Yehu, the son of Hananiah the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the wicked and love them that hate Yehoah? And before you finish the verse, read that again. Shouldest thou help the wicked and love them that hate Yehoah? So think about everything that we do in our lives. Amen. Think about all the Israelites out there that or Israel. But think about, are you helping those that help Jehovah? Are you helping those that hate Jehovah? Amen. And hating Jehovah based on their actions. Is, this is not a talk against unity at all. Amen. 
Because this is supposed, unity is supposed to happen. It's going to happen. Amen. God said, we read about Ezekiel, he's going to join the stick of Ephraim with the stick of Judah, and the sticks will be one in his hand. Talk about it. But that means in Jehovah's hand. We're all supposed to be unifying under Jehovah God. So we have to be mindful of the people that claim they're Israel, that or to say they're Israel. We know they're Israel, but their ways and or their words show that they hate Jehovah. Amen. Talk about it. So therefore, that's very important. That's why the first, Jehoshaphat could have died in battle. That could have been the easy thing. Think about it. Jehovah, but we know Jehovah God is in control of life and death. Life and death. Because Jehoshaphat asked for God's advice second as opposed to doing it first, even though Jehoshaphat heard the word of Jehovah from the prophet and decided to go to the battle anyway, Amen. Jehovah could have killed him in the battle. God got him killed in the battle as opposed to Ahab. We've read many times in scripture where, especially with the prophet that um, didn't listen, to, that spoke the word of God, but didn't listen to all of the word, right. and got killed by the lion on the way back, and he didn't follow every instruction, while the person that he was prophesying against continued to live, the one that was doing evil. This could have been reversed. Because Jehoshaphat didn't follow the, direct, the directive of Jehovah God, it could have been him that was killed in the battle, and, hey, and hey, Ahab, who was always evil anyway, walking back home in peace. Amen. But there's a message behind this. Jehoshaphat was able to get back to his home in peace to receive this specific message here and read it once again. Shouldest thou help the wicked and love them that hate Jehovah? For this thing wrath is going out upon thee from before Jehovah. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee in that thou hast put away the Ashtarot out of the land and has set thy heart to seek God. So Jehovah told him, because of the goodness that was done before that, he was spared. But it doesn't mean that he was correct the way he did. So mm -hmm. we, he still had to face that shame and that contempt based on that act. So we have to be careful of what we do. We always have to be wholehearted with ourselves before Jehovah and make sure that our company that we keep is wholehearted as well. And Jehoshaphat is going to go forth and do more reforms because what's... What he does here is learn from the lesson, which we have to learn. And now we have to learn from the lessons that are given unto us. So now he's going to go forth and do more reforms. So he went forth and he placed teachers in various places of Judah. Now he's going to go a little step further. Continue. Verse 4. And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem. And he went out again among the people from Be'er Sheva to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back unto Jehovah, the God of their fathers. And he set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Yehuda, city by city, and said unto the judges, Consider what ye, de what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for Jehovah. And he is with you giving, in giving judgment. Now therefore let the fear of Jehovah be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with, the, with Yehovah our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of bribes. So he went forth initially and sent out people to teach, but also what is imperative for all the Israelites to have people that judge. So he went forth and he sent out judges off Be'er Be 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 Sheba is the southernmost part of the kingdom of Judah, and the hills of Ephraim, of course, is outside of the kingdom of Judah, is going into the northern kingdom. But he was able to have some sort of influence going into that area of Ephraim, so now he sent people to judge the people. And he told them specifically, and it's the same thing that Moses told the judges in the book of Deuteronomy during the time of Moses, that it's not about man. You're judging because of Jehovah God. Amen. And don't fear anybody. Don't take any bribes. Do not have any respect of person. So those are two things that are critical for us to survive as a congregation, for, for Israel to survive as a community, and overall as a nation. We need people that go forth and teach the word where the people need the word and also go forth and judge the people because they're going to be matters that have to be judged. And you can't let, it's not just about tearing down the idols because you, when people are wronging each other, that is also evil. Amen. And matters have to be judged. Welcome and on. the conflicts between people also causes the nation to go down. So you can have a congregation that has no idolatry whatsoever, but you have people that are dissatisfied because they're not getting proper judgment. That also brings stain upon the congregation Amen. and causes evil to descend upon the congregation. Amen. So he tells them this, that Jehovah, there's no iniquity with Jehovah our God, so don't respect any persons nor take any bribes. He said that before, that consider what you do, for you judge not for man, but you judge for Jehovah. So everybody that is a judge in any case has to realize that. You're not Amen. judging because of the individual. You're judging for Jehovah. Amen. And when you judge, you make sure that you do it in a manner that Jehovah God would be pleased with you, 
not the plaintiff or the defendant being pleased with you. Amen. Continue. Verse 8. Moreover, in Yerushalayim did Jehoshaphat set up the Levites and the priests and of the heads of the father's houses of Israel for the judgment of Yehoah and for the controversies, and they returned to Jerusalem. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of Yehoah, faithfully and with a whole heart. And whensoever any controversy shall come unto you from your brethren that dwell within their cities, between blood and blood, between law and commandment, statutes and ordinance, ye shall warn them that they be not guilty towards Yehoah. And so wrath come and so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren, this shall ye do, and ye shall not be guilty. And behold, Amartya the chief priest who was over all matters of Yehoah, and Zebediah the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Yehuda, in all the king's matters, also the officers of the Levites before you, deal courageously, and Yehoah be with be with good with the good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So these are the things that we have to learn. We can learn from the life of Jehoshaphat. There's, there's other things that's going to come up in the next few weeks, in the next coming, up the coming chapters. But we also have to learn from that message, that don't align yourself with those that hate Yehoshaphat God through their words and through their actions. And also learn from the good deeds of Jehoshaphat and make the reforms that are necessary in order for the congregation, community, and nation overall to be built up by removing all men of evil. So the judges were set in place, not just to tear down idolatry, but to help people one with another, and that's how you re eradicate evil from the midst of you. So we thank the Most High God for our lives. We thank him for the Holy Shabbat day that he has allowed us to observe, praying that the words that came forth were the words of Yehovah, not the words of mankind, and praying that the Most High would teach us all and guide us in the way that we should walk before him. Hallelujah.